Good afternoon, Guyana, and thank you for joining us for this edition of our theme, Government in Transition. My name is Hugh Todd, and today our guest is Bishop Juan Egel, who is a former minister and national candidate for the People's Progressive Party Civic. Bishop, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for having me and greetings to all of your viewers and listeners. As we are aware, we've had a protracted elections period. It's coming to an end. The fight is still on to get GCOM to do the right thing in accordance with the rule of law. And we are here today to give the people of Guyana some amount of uh, clarity on what has been unfolding over the last two days. Um, Bishop, you're very much aware that within GCOM, there's a lot of focus on the chief elections officer. He has been using his portfolio to manipulate the system to give the PNC-led coalition government an advantage in these elections. And everyone is aware that he is trying to subvert the rule of law. He has gone as far as to invalidate 275,092 votes. Startling, very unprofessional. The international organizations, People's Progressive Party, Civic, citizens alike, we all know what he's trying to do. We all know that the People's Progressive Party, Civic, won these elections based on the numbers that were generated out of the recount process. How do you view Lowingfield in his position and his integrity as a chief elections officer? Well, you let me begin first. We are where we are now because of the failure of Mr. Lowingfield as the chief elections officer to act within his statutory responsibilities since early March. If when Mr. Clement Mingo had fictitiously and fraudulently declared those results, Mr. Lowenfield had made public and had used the statements of poll that are in his possession, which he received separate and apart from Mr. Mingo, we didn't have to be where we are today. We would have long had a democratically elected government, and this country would have been under democratic governance. The lives of people would have been improving, and we would have been better. He failed to act, because just like how every returning officer received copies of original statements of poll from presiding officers, Mr. Lowenfield is in possession of 2,339 statements of poll that came directly to him as the chief elections officer. So apart from the PPP, the PNC, and the returning officers, knowing the results of these elections, the one other person who knew the results very early was Mr. Keith Lewinfield. And he has failed to act, and he has played into the game. We have then moved to the motions that we took to GCOM where we were asking for him to uh, display his statements of a poll and the rest of it, all of that failed. We went to the recount, a recount that was done under his supervision and his management. And I can tell you as one of the counting agents, Mr. Lowenfield and a number of senior operatives of GCOM were working every day to satisfy, bending over to satisfy the narrative of the APNU AFC. As a matter of fact, while the APNU AFC were making all of those allegations about people being dead and people uh, being overseas and voting, when we objected and stated our reasons for our objection, under Mr. Lowenfield's leadership, the observation report could have only recorded we objected to the APNU's objection. Nothing else could have been stated. So it was no surprise to me that when he was asked to submit his report, yes. he was forced because of public knowledge of the 10 certified uh, district results, but then in that report, try to capture verbatim, word for word, the PNC-led APNU AFC's narrative, making it very subjective, seeking to invalidate and disenfranchise Guyanese based upon allegations that were never substantiated, tested to be true. All you had to do was to sit in a room and say, I object to number 56 or to 233. 
that was captured. No evidence was ever recorded. And Mr. Lowenfield, as the chief elections officer, moved that subjectivity into a report that now he's seeking to want to use in the context of an interpretation of what is credible and what is not credible. The only conclusion any person of decency and honesty can come to is that he's either part of the APNU AFC's rigging scheme, he's either facilitating the APNU AFC's rigging scheme, or he is the author of the APNU AFC's rigging scheme. So he has to answer to one of those three scenarios. And as a statutory officer under the Constitution of Guyana, I think that everybody should be watching him with 24 eyes because his action over the last 100 plus days have not been without fear or favor, ill will or without malice. Thank you for that, uh, Bishop. But not only that his delaying tactics are affecting um, Guyanese uh, based on their anticipation of this transition and their desire to have a new government in place, but it's also fueling the this so-called uh, caretaker government, uh, their ambition to continue to plunder the st state resources. Um, how do you view the two? The fact that the delaying tactics to get the government somewhat be recognized by GCOM and the courts as legitimate in his view, and at the same time, they're, they're trying to see how much they can pull for away at the state resources because we know that there is a lot of land giveaways being done recently. Um, are they too, are they connected? What is your view? They're definitely, they're definitely connected. That will have to take me back to December 21st, 2018. Mr. Lowenfield's first statement was that he'll be ready to provide elections within the constitutionally mandated time based upon the no confidence motion, which was 90 days. Then we saw all the shenanigans that took place at GCOM that Mr. Lowenfield is the chief elections officer for. We saw all of the delays through the court, then the delays through GCOM with an election taking place on March 7th. All of this was facilitated by Mr. Lowenfield. When it went to the recount, Guyanese must be, rem must be reminded, Mr. Lowenfield came up with a 156-day recount plan. Please remember that. Now, while all of those delays were being facilitated. What did Granger and his undemocratic cabal did? They started a process of squandermania, giveaway, securing themselves, family, and cronies for the future with the resources of the state. They continue to act as if they're legal. They never behaved as a caretaker government. And Granger got all of the time that he needed to do every illegality that he wanted, along with his so-called cabinet and the Reagan cabal, we had the election. They lost the election. They should have been out of government since sometime March 5th or March 6th. It was Lowenfield's reluctance and unwillingness to perform his statutory function that led to us having a delay without a declaration of some 108 counting days. And during that time, check what this illegal government has been doing. Signing contracts for people's employment, uh, and those are the political appointees. Giving out civil works contracts, totaling multiplied millions, including one of over a billion that we know about, which is the Ocean View International Hotel, which is now they're calling some infectious disease hospital, the giveaway yes. of state land, the giveaway of prime waterfront property to people entering into engagements that are costing the state millions and tens of millions of dollars. We now have a situation at GPL where they're buying those bucket trucks and you're seeing the inflated cost and the flimsy explanation that was given by GPL as to why it cost so much. All of these things have been facilitated because Lowenfield, as a statutory officer, is not acting in keeping with his oath of office to ensure that the elections are declared in a timely manner, providing opportunities for the APNU AFC to go to court and to keep dragging things out, buying time to carry out this rape 
of the Guyanese Treasury. And the two things are not operating singularly. They are operating in concert. It, yes. It's been facilitated. And Mr. Lowen, we must remind ourselves that Mr. Lowenfield himself benefited from property, residential property, at the back of Mocha, and more than 100 acres of land at Millie's Hideout, all of that after the passage of the no-confidence motion. These are things that we're not talking about now, but we made them public before now. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Juan. Uh, we would like to also welcome uh, Comrade Gail Teixeira, PVP Party Executive. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, Gail, as we bring to the people of Guyana government in transition and to bring clarity on the events that have occurred over the last several days. Uh, Gail, if I may bring you in at this point, the, David Granger had mentioned that he was dealing with four Cs. If I recall him correctly, he was talking about the chair, the commission, uh, CARICOM, and the courts. But now we're hearing that from some of the operatives within his camp that they may have a legal, a legal technicality may allow them to hold on to power through the back door. I would like you to address this because this is a serious matter. David Grange himself said that Caricom was a the chief interlocutor in this process. He has never spoken on the report from the Caricom team, and now we are at the court. Another C that he is that he put forward, and he's nowhere to be seen. But Ramjetan said it publicly that. There's a legal technicality that can be sought to allow this regime to continue in power. Can you unmute your mic? <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry about coming in late. We were having some glitches here at my end with the laptops and the uh, internet. So thank you very much for letting me in. You and hello to Bishop. This is how the only way we see each other sometimes, virtually. Yes. But uh, to all your viewers, uh, good afternoon. Every day that we're in Guyana, um, something new happens, something new develops that um, challenges us as Guyanese to really keep our faith and to be able to keep our focus on what is at stake. And that is the issue of the threat to democracy in our country and the attempt of the Apno way of seeing collaboration with GCOM to uh, steal the election, to derail democracy and to steal the election. The issue of a technicality, I'm not very, very familiar with what they're talking about at all. The Constitution makes it very clear, it talks about elections and the process in which a president is uh, deemed to be a, a president and, and to be sworn in, etc. Yes. There is only one aspect in the Constitution that I think is not applicable at all, and that is issues to do with a state of war, which we're not in. So under a state of war, and uh, the president in a period where there's no parliament can uh, govern for 12 months at a time, but we're not in a state of war. So I don't see what technicality, and in fact, that wouldn't be a technicality. It would be a, a provision under the Constitution. The issue of the court case that uh, the case we are taking to the CCG, I understand that they're saying that the case cannot go to the CCG because, again, they're going back to the Constitution and saying that the Court of Appeal is the final court on this issue. However, we feel very confident that this matter can go before the CCJ and the CCJ will examine it and give us uh, a ruling. So I'm not sure what kind of, uh, <laughs> what technicality. All I can be aware of is one that's unconstitutionally illegal, and that is the government yes. using every single means possible to extend their life in a situation where they should have gone long ago. I mean, we have said that as a party, we have been found to be the winner three times. Uh, two times in the last three months. Well, yeah. the Granger administration has been defeated three times at the no confidence motion, at the March 2nd election, yeah. at the recount, uh, which we heard the results on, uh, they, we had the tabulations of June the 9th. And so, and this Despite all his claims that he's willing to abide by the election, the results, it is, he's doing everything possible to remain in power. So for me, there's no technicality. It's an issue of illegality and attempting to hold on to power in the face of 
the government really being alone, APNU AFC being alone. I mean, there's never been a situation in this country where we have international support, regional support, where the CARICOM, they are the ones that said that, and I don't know if Bishop mentioned this earlier, this was the CARICOM was the legitimate authority and observer. And so the, the legitimate observer, this was their excuse for not allowing back the Carter Center, not having other people and stuff like that and making all these yeah. very rich about persons in the Western world. Having said all that, the CARICOM team came out with a report that made it very clear the recount was transparent and that the, despite some weaknesses, they have no doubt there they are, are of unshakable belief that the elections were credible and this was the winner should be declared, uh, the People's Progressive Party Civic is the winner and should be declared and to uh, move towards setting up a government. The OAS, the same point, said that, that they even went to the point of saying that the Granger administration should start making preparations to transition to the legitimately elected government, legitimately elected government of Ghana, meaning the PVPC. So I think that what we're seeing unravel is what we have been observing all along was a conspiracy. And I really do believe now we've used the words about trying to steal the election. I, I am of the view now that there has been a conspiracy and a, a plot to ensure that APNU so-called won in 2020. And the plot was started even before the um, no confidence vote was, was brought to the House. And this was started by a number of means, including appointing key persons in to the state agencies, as well as, of course, GCOM with Patterson. So yeah. that we have been seeing a conspiracy unravel and, and up to today, where you have seen in the court yesterday, two of the three judges rule on an issue which is extraordinarily um, unprecedented in a sense, because they have ruled that on an issue which is really outside of their jurisdiction and one in which they're actually, which is what is so dangerous, is that they're not interpreting the Constitution. They've actually made an amendment to the Constitution, which <laughs> the courts have no such power. They, the, only the Parliament can do so. And so I think that we have to recognize that the move by the PVPC to the, the, court, the CCJ today was critical. Um, one, because we are questioning the jurisdictional issue of the Court of Appeal on this matter, that was brought by Eslin David for the APNO AFC. And also, so we, we're going through that phase. If we, I think if we had not, the, the possibility existed that Mr. Lowenfield would have used his figures to disenfranchise 275,000 people. And, and so we have to deal with that reality. I heard my friend Bishop talking about the abuse of power, the executive lawlessness, corruption. This is what we've been seeing going on since the he came into government. And in fact, in the period in the last year and more, especially in this period of um, during the elections, 100 and what day are we at now? 113, 114 days that they seem to have gone absolutely berserk and are just giving away state assets um, and not publicizing and not making the information available so that um, property of the state, property of the people of Ghana are being uh, squandered and given away all over the place. So this is a government, I think, that's uh, running amok in a sense, if I could say that. The government, is, and, and, and of course a de facto government, is that it's running amok and that we have to be very, very vigilant in this period. Um, I wanted to, and, I, and we'll do it later in the program, I wanted to, to give examples, which I'm sure Bishop is aware too, of the how extraordinary Lowenfield's figures are. Here's a man who, and I just want to say this part about Lowenfield, because I heard um, Bishop talking about him, is that here's a man who presented to GCOM on June the 14th, the issue of the actual recount, the actual statistics, the, the recounts um, for the 10 regions, general and regional elections, and then proceeded in the most perverse mind, if you could call that a perverse warped mind, to then sit down and go through each region and apportion by some very um, mystical mathematical formula, yes. take away from the people. It is, it, is so, it is so beyond a rational, reasonable mind to have done this. And I've been looking at the figures all the time and trying to figure out in my head, how could 
he do this? How could anybody do this? To sit down and very, oh, how do you call it? Um, consciously sit and say, okay, for region one, uh, PPP, you got um, uh, 8,002 votes. Well, we'll make it 5,226. Yeah. Uh, for region six, uh, PPP got 43,440. We'll give you 5,000. What, what kind of mind? does that and therefore what i've been asking myself and, and i'm sure bishop will have many answers to this as he was talking and that is why does loin fields feel invincible why does he feel that he can steal the votes of 275,000 people in this country to put apno in place for 125,000 votes for APNU and 56,000 for the PPP. What, I think we have to really look at those figures as an example of a level of dangerousness, of deviousness uh, that to all of our people. And so the, the you know, I, I, it's lawlessness, but it's also a view that they really believe they can get away with this. They yes. really believe and that is what is, is frightening, that they could take, and in fact, it shows the desperation, Todd and Bishop, of the APNU. To, they are willing to accept 125,000 votes to go into Parliament. That is less than what they made in 2011. It is less than what they made in 2015. It's about a little half about that. My maths aren't right. They're willing to hold on to that that straw mm -hmm. to be in part, into government again. And then of course- but it, gives them a, but it, it gives them a two-thirds majority. But that's because the critical issue, of course, of course. Well, that's, that's I and, think- And that is, that is the wickedness of Lone Field. It's not just Lone Field, it's the whole- Yeah, but I think that that's where okay, the 25,000 extra comes in. Because here, Apnu says 250,000 were irregular. And here is Lauren Field giving them 275,000, uh, sorry, um, taking out 275,000, 20,000 more, 25,000 more. And I think that's where the trick was, that that was where they contrived it so as to give them the two thirds majority. Yeah. This is not Lauren Field alone doing this. This is a cabal of people who have been Working sitting down yes. and, and constructing this, this horror uh, to, to steal elections from our people. And if one way doesn't work, they do it the other way. Yes. And so Lowenfield, the fact that Lowenfield is the, the, the target in a sense, oh, because, but he has been complicit, he is part of it, and that he clearly feels he's protected, that nothing will happen to him. Yes. So uh, thank you for that, Gail. Juan, if you can remember the question, the statement, do you remember the statement when I first mentioned it? I was talking about the fact that, Bishop, can you hear me? I'm hearing you now, sorry. Yeah. Yes, you recall the question that I had asked, Gail? It was yeah, about yes, the, yes. the legal, legal uh, technicalities. technicalities that were being uh, put forward by the well, well, security well, government. My could view. You, yeah, could you answer that quickly and then mention a little bit about the CCJ? And Gail will come back to you to close uh, closing arguments and then we have to wrap up because we're out of time actually. It is clear. Lowenfield is trying to use the observation report to invalidate valid votes. And he's wanting, like Gail was saying, to use those observation reports, every box where there was a question or an allegation made by the PNC. And they made those allegations only in areas where the PPP see as a stronghold. They didn't make allegations against any box in Linden, any box in the south of Georgetown, in the boxes in New Amsterdam where they have the majority supporters. But wherever the PPPC has a stronghold, they made allegations. Yes. Once an allegation was made, loyalty has invalidated all of those votes in the box, which are the majority PPPC votes. And he's hoping by his mathematical gymnastics that he has performed to hand the AP and UAFC a victory by the use of those observation reports. And that is why they are celebrating because they're trying to know, if you notice the press statement of last night, when the two judges said uh, more votes cast must be interpreted to mean more valid votes valid cast, votes. they have gone to say credible votes, credible votes. That is why I'm happy yeah. 
that the party has moved to the CCJ, number one, to deal with this thing in its finality, because they were hoping to exert political influence even in the judiciary, and I yes. say that guidedly, to give them an outcome that they will be able to go and tell the whole world, well, you see, it is true that the PPPC got 233,336 votes, but they were not valid. When the commission checked valid votes based upon the Court of Appeals definition, they only got 56,000, and we got 126,000, and we had the majority in Parliament. So that is what they were hoping to do. And I'm surprised that Ramsey Khan, being a lawyer and someone who's stood up in his past life to ensure democracy prevail, would even be using that theory that was handed to him by the rigging cabal to mount it because he went to Borbis and assured the people in Borbis that we're going to get it. We're going to get it. It is shameless. It's bare-faced thievery. And it is deception to the highest extent, and it will not succeed. So thank you, you. Thank you. And Gail, we'll close with you. You've lived in the dark days fighting against the PNC at that time until we finally got free and fair elections for the first time in 1992. Could you have imagined that we would be at this position where we're fighting for the next generation. We fought for the first generation in 1992. We're back here in 2020, fighting again for the next generation, which means that the generation we fought for in 1992 is back to square one. We have won. We will be in government. Your closing remarks. Well, first of all, I think that uh, we, we, I don't think all is lost. I agree with you that uh, we will win. We shall win having gone through the long years of fighting for democracy and watching the party's steadfastness and uh, doggedness to ensure that democracy was restored in Guyana. We are reaping the benefits now of a PVPC having been in government for 20 odd years, not just the usual social economic conditions, but sometimes we, we ignore the fact that democracy was restored, restored by the People's Progressive Party Civic. And an entire generation has grown up under a democratic framework. Yes. And that is yes. what is playing out now, 20 odd years later, is that, yes, my generation would have said, no, this could not happen again. It, it would not happen again. And many of the young people, when we used to talk to them a couple of years ago and say, there is this threat. As we warned in, in 2015, we yes. warned in 2015 on the platform that this is what Granger was going to be like and the APNU was going to be like. And people just did not listen to us. Majority did not listen to us. And therefore, this young generation is what is exciting for me for the future because they have they've said to us, you, you, you all kept talking about this thing all the time and we felt it would never happen again and you're just living in the past. A bunch of old fogies living in the past. They have now come to appreciate how precious democracy is. Fragile, yes. but yes. precious. And that how it is, and, and I think as a people, despite what has been put in our play in our in our way by the APNU AFC, that we have proven our ability to stand up, to countermand every attempt they put up, to yes. derail the elections, to derail democracy. And I think APNU, I think, and Granger has underestimated the fact that the Guyanese people, not just the PPPC were willing to stand up for democracy and, and not That's allow this to pass. And yes. so I, I want to say to our viewers that, you know, uh, and I think Bishop knows this better than me, the issue of, and this too will pass. I think there's a saying like that in... in, in statement. Uh, so, yes, yes. This too, will pass. And this too will pass. We are being sorely tried and tested and we are showing a level of, of bravery, of resilience as a people and we are not alone. And so, yes, we have another hurdle to go through. We've now gone to the CCJ on a, on a limited issue, but it is an important one because what happened in the courts yesterday is extraordinarily dangerous for the future. And so we have to go through one more hurdle, but with each, each hurdle we cross, we're getting closer and closer to the time when uh, Air Fun will be be sworn in and the PPC will in government. It's just that we have to 
go through this. And I want to just say a last lick, and that is to say to the Guyanese population that we have been extraordinarily patient and extraordinarily disciplined. And this has come to the notice of the foreign missions in Guyana, the, the international regional community. And this has been the power of us to be able to stay resilient. And so we may have other hurdles to cross. We may have other bridges to cross, but we're going to make it. And so what we have to make, make sure is that the Lowenfield Cabal and the Apnu Cabal and Granger Cabal are not succeeding in taking away 275,000 voters from this election and to not steal our election. And that's where we have to be focused and our energies focused on at this time. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you very much, Gail. Bishop, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. You've brought much clarity to the ongoing issue as we transition, as the government in transition, democracy will be upheld, the people's will will be accepted, and we will have a new president, Dr. Irfan Ali, be sworn in soon. So to the Guyanese people, continue to be resilient, continue to remain calm. Thank you for your patience. And soon we'll be together working to rebuild this great nation of ours. Thank you very much and goodbye and have a good evening. Thank you. God's blessings. Good evening. <laughs>